Yehuda. Chana Bas Yehuda. Neshama should have an aliyah. Okay. We're on uh, Daf. Hey, hey, Omid Aleph. You're not going to join us today? Okay, it's all right. It's okay. 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 <clears throat> We're dealing with the machlokis between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. We know that there is a, the discussion from yesterday's daf was, we know that the Torah says, ve'etzim lo sishbiruvo, that you're not allowed to break a bone of the Korban Pesach. But the Mishnah had qualified that and said that's only true if there's meat on the bone. But if there's no meat on the bone, if it's just a dry bone, then you're allowed to break it. The question now is, between, and it's the subject of a machlokas between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish, what is the halacha if there's a long bone and a portion of the bone has meat on it and another portion of the bone does not have meat on it, are you allowed to break the part of the bone that is meatless, mm-hmm. even though there's meat on the other portion, on the other end of the bone? So Rabbi Yochanan says it's asr, and Reish Lakish says it's mutar. In other words, there's no isr, for, uh, I should really use more precise language. There's no violation of the etzim l'sish beruvo, of this halacha of not breaking bones, if you, uh, says, says Reish Lakish, if you break it on the part which is meatless. Didn't we learn that the marrow is also basar? Yes, now that's also true. The marrow is also considered to be basar, yes. even though the marrow is inside. And yesterday the Gemara had said that one might have thought yes. that <clears throat> the mitzvah's ase, the positive commandment of eating basar, would supersede the mitzvah's los ase of breaking bones. And therefore we have a special um, uh, phrase, uh, phraseology in the Pasuk that teach me that even if your objective in breaking the bone is to get to the marrow, it's still going to be prohibited. So when we say that there's no violation when you break a, a meatless bone, it's got to be both meatless on the exterior and meatless on the interior. It's got to be a marrowless bone as well. Okay, so now the Gemara is going to challenge one of the two opinions. We're up to the word mesve, which is about uh, 15 lines down. Now, this is going to be our next Mishnah, which we're going to see in just a few minutes. It's on, it's on Ahmed Beis. The Mishnah says that if a portion of the, if a limb of a sacrificial animal is sticking outside of where it's supposed to be eaten. Now, in general, the Korban Pesach and any other Kachim column is allowed to be eaten anywhere in Yerushalayim. So let's say my Chabura is gathering right by the wall of the city, okay? And a limb accidentally protrudes out of the wall of Yerushalayim. Or if I'm eating Kachim, kachi and the limb of the animal accidentally protrudes out of the walls of the courtyard of the temple. So in either situation, the animal has gone past its environs, its permitted environs. The halacha is, is that that portion of the animal is no longer consumable, it's usr, and you have to sever that portion from the rest of the animal. There's only one portion problem. When you're dealing with a carbon Pesach, you're not allowed to break a bone. So you can't just take a cleaver and go whack, because then you're breaking a bone. So what are you supposed to do? So let's say the bone, uh, the, the limb, which is a, a solid bone, let's say it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a fibia and a, and a tibula, right, together, okay? A tibia and a fibula. A tibia, a tibia and a fibula, sorry. A tibia and a fibula together. And, um, and you've got it sticking out, okay? Uh, <clears throat> half of it's out and half of it's in. What you have to do is make an incision at the place which is right before it starts to go outside and cut down to, just to the bone and then gently peel back the flesh until you peel it all the way back to that you expose the joint. What would that joint be called? Which one you're going, you're going uh, backwards? Mm-hmm. Is, that, is, the is that the elbow the or the knee? It's the knee. That's the knee. The that would be the knee. Tibia fibula is down. Tibia down there. Okay, so then you, you, you get to the knee. So you get to a joint. Oh, <laughs> how about the radius and the ulna? That, we'll do the, the radius elbow. and the ulna. Okay, so you get... Because there, there's no bone at the elbow. So you get, you get to the joint, you get to the radius, and you pull back the, from the meat off of the radius and the ulna, and you get to the elbow. Now, obviously, now we're not talking about a human being here. I don't even know if lambs have <laughs> radii and ulnas. Okay, but anyway, so you get back to the elbow joint, 
And at that point, you break it apart because there's no, you're not breaking a bone now. You're separating it from the joint. Mm -hmm. And then you basically, you get to eat the meat that's now a boneless, right? You've basically deboned it, the portion that was on the inside. And you have to discard the entire bone because it was partially in and partially out. What about okay? the marrow that was inside? Well, well, no, we're not discussing marrow now. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So anyway, um, so the e amart aver shenol of kezayis baser b'makom zeh the yeshol of b'makom acher imbo mishum shviras etzem lameli the kolif ad shemagila berk v'chosech niklof be porta v'nitzbere. The Gemara's question is that if the halacha is as you are saying, Reish Lakish, that as long as the part of the bone that you wish to cut is, meat, is meatless, then there's no iser of the etzim l'sishpur, there's no iser of, of breaking the bone at that point, then why do you have to peel the meat back all the way to the joint? Just peel back a small portion of meat and slide it off the bone, and then hack it, then, then break the bone there. Why do you have to separate it at the joint just since you've removed the meat off of that part of the bone, it should be permitted now to break it. The prohibition, according to Yurish Lakers, is only to break it when there's meat on it. But if there's no meat on it, it's okay. So the Gemara answers, Abaya Omar Mishum Pekka, Ravina Omar Bikoilis. So Abaya says the one answer. He says that if we were to mit, per, permit you, really technically, according to Yurish Lakers, that would be okay. But our fear is, is that if we allow you to smash it at that small juncture with a cleaver, you may end up inadvertently shattering some of the bone that's still remaining underneath the meat. And therefore, rabbinically, we require you to peel it all the way back to the joint. Ravina gives a different answer, and he says that we're dealing with, as Alan had argued, we're dealing with a bone that has marrow in it. So we're dealing with a colis, which is like a, I don't know what... A, it's a thigh bone. A thigh bone, femur. right? A femur. We're dealing with a femur. And because we're dealing with a femur which is filled with marrow, so then, so then Rashi you. Rashi says hayam. What? Rashi says hayam. Call it. Don't deal with hayam. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what it says here. Thigh bone. I also thought colis was a thigh bone. Yeah, so what, which, what is one second? The colis. A few lines up. The ishbo mach mitoch. So. You don't have to say rondundil. Oh, yeah, he saw it. it's the upper arm. It's the upper arm. It's the upper arm is the same thing as the femur, but for an animal because it's either the front leg or the hind leg. Yeah. yeah, either way. What, what do you call the upper arm in an animal? Uh, humerus. I mean, I is it the humerus? The humerus. That's what it is. It's the humerus, but the humerus has marrow. Tanan Okay, so there's a, a Mishnah a Mishna in. Um, Mishnah later on that we're going to see. Hapigul v'hanos or metamin Okay, we have, we have uh, the halacha as follows. This is a totally new shaila that's related to our issue. Chazal were gozer that if a kohen touches sacrificial meat that has become disqualified either through pigul or nosar. Pigul is, remember what? Where while the kohen is doing the avoda, He's having thoughts about either eating or doing a later stage of the avoda, chutz lizmano, at the wrong time. And nosar is where it's not tainted because of any thoughts, but rather the meat has gone past its expiration point and um, it's no longer consumable. In both of those cases, both pigul and nosar, it's not, it's, the meat is usr. But chazal were gozer further, and they said not only is it usr, but if you touch it, your hands become tummy. Now, Rav Huna ver Rav Chiz the Chadam and Pibnei Chashadei Kuhuna, the Chadam and Pibnei Atzle Kuhuna. Mar Masni Apigul, Mar Masni Anoser. Man de Masni Apigul Mishum Chashadei Kuhuna, Man de Masni Anoser Mishum Atzle Kuhuna. Now, the Gemara is basically saying, as Rav Chana, Chananel explains, that each one supplies a reason for this Gezeira. But it's not that they're disagreeing with each other, <clears throat> but rather they're addressing, a, a, they're, each one is re addressing a different respective case. Rav Huna and uh, Rav Chizdas, one says that the reason for this gezeira is because of cheshadei kahuna. We suspect that kohanim may act maliciously, and as a disincentive for a kohen to act maliciously to, to deliberately um, dis contaminate someone else's carbon, we tell them that if you touch it, you're going to become Tame. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, opinion is that the reason why we're, we make your hands Tame is because we're worried that Kohanim are going to be lazy 
and they're going to allow meat to go beyond its expiration point. So as a disincentive, we declare your hands to be tummy if you, if you touch the nosa. But they're not disagreeing. The opinion that talks about malicious kohanim is referring to why we make pigle tongue. And the reason why we're worried about lazy kohanim is because that person was addressing the issue of nosar, which is meat that's left over. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the point is, is there's an interesting Tosfus over here. Tosfus asks the question, if you're dealing with malicious kohanim who are going to contaminate someone else's carbon through pigle, which is clearly an Esr de Orisa, what kind of disincentive are you creating for an avrayan, for a sinner, by declaring his hands to be tummy? If he's not worried about pigle, why should he be worried about tumma? So Tosva says, you see that in the times of the Beis HaMikdash, even sinners were concerned about tumma. That was completely taboo and off the table, even for people who were malicious, sinful people. The Gemara in Yoma relates a story about two Kohanim who were competing with each other, and in order to eliminate the other Kohen, who was, they were running up the ramp at the same time, one Kohen stabbed the other. But they were, they were more worried about the knife becoming tame through the corpse than they were about the act of murder. So you see that there was, there was a time of great corruption, of social breakdown in the times of, towards the end of the Second Temple, and the, therefore the rabbis knew that people, oh, tuma, it sort of reminds you of what certain religions are doing today for the sake of religion, right? Exploding yourself and killing thousands, hundreds of innocent people, thousands of innocent people is okay as long as we do it for our religion, right? If she's so anyway. five times a day, though, how's right. she doing? Mar Masni Kezayis, Umar Masni Kebeis. Now we have another machlokis between Rav, Rav Chizda and Rav Huna. One says that how much of the meat that is nosar or pigle do you have to have in order for your hands to become tame? So one says you need to have a Kezayis, and the other one says, no, you need to have a Kebeis. If it's smaller than a kibetz, though your hands will not become tummy. So man demasni kizayis ki isuro, man demasni kibetz ki tumaso. If you learn that it's you need the re- the requisite shear to make your hands tummy as a kizayis, why is that? Because just like to consume a kizayis of nos or kizayis of pigle is the iser, right? Makes you chayiv. So so too, that's the amount that you need in order to make your hands tummy. But the other mandarma says, no, you need a kibetza, because normally the requisite shear, that a food item which is tame, needs in order to make other things tame, is a kibetza. So therefore here it's no different. So based on this machlokes, Rav Huna and Rav Chizda, the question is now raised. What about yotze? What about basar that goes outside of its permitted environs? If I touch that meat, do my hands become tame there too? So maybe the, the, the question that the Gemara is equivocating over here is like this. If we compare the issue of a busser leaving its environs to the case of Nosar, which is based upon uh, um, Kohanim who are irreverent or negligent, let's say, Maybe we're only concerned about passive negligence, about letting meat go past its expiration time. But active negligence to deliberately take something outside the temple through, through, just, uh, through, through negligence, we don't have to be concerned about. Obviously, uh, there's nothing malicious in the act of taking the busser out, because, so therefore it's not comparable to Piggle, because just because you take a portion of meat outside doesn't mean you disqualify the carbon. So it's not comparable to Piggle, but it is comparable to Nosar. So the question is, just like Nosar makes a hand's tummy, does this also or not? So Toshma, Ever Shiyatsa Miktsaso, Chosech at Shemagila, Etzim Vekolef at Shemagila, Perk Vechosech. So what did the Mishnah say? The Mishnah had said that what do you have to do if the limb uh, goes outside? You have to peel back the meat and cut it at the joint. The Gemara's question is, is as follows. He says, even if we allow you to cut, to make an incision at the point where the, the limb is protruding outside and peel back the meat, but how can we permit that meat? At that point, at that juncture, where a portion of the meat was outside and the other portion of the meat is inside, there's a connection point between those two, between that meat. Meat and meat are connected. And so, so, so what if you, if the meat is peeled back, but it became tummy by being in, in, in direct physical contact with the meat that was outside? So it should be also because it's tummy. 
So the Gemara answers, Tumas Torim Hi, the Tumas Torim Lo Metamya. The Gemara says that if the only way that something is making physical contact is through a fusion that is not visible to the exterior because it's fused together, so then <clears throat> that's not called physical contact for the purposes of Tumas. Uh, paradoxically, physical contact for Tuma has to be when two disparate units are in contact with each other. But if, if two things are really one to the point where they're fused together, that's not called enough of a, that's not called physical contact uh, for Tuma, for transmission of Tuma, because it's called Tuma storm. The, 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 the connection is not, is not evident. It's not an evident, it's not a detectable connection. So the Gemara now says, But that won't work according to Ravina. This is the discussion elsewhere in Shas, where Ravina says that particles of food, even when they're fused together to make one solid food mass, are, are considered to be disparate units, dis- disparate molecules of food. And therefore, they are considered to be disparate units that are touching each other. And therefore, the, the meat that is inside should be considered to be connected to a source of tumma, which is the meat on the outside. So the Gemara says, you must deduce from there, ha-kanaga adadi v'kamitame. You must deduce from here that if the meat on the outside is going to make the meat on the inside tummy, it would not be permitted. The fact that we do permit it must be that the meat on the outside is not tummy. So, Ela Laman Damasni Kazayas, the Lesbe Kazayas, Laman Damasni Kabates, the Lesbe Kabates. The Gemara says, no, not necessarily so. It could be that the meat is tummy if it goes outside. Why doesn't it contaminate the meat that's, that it's connected to on the inside? Either because there's less than a kazayas that's outside or less than a kabetza outside, according to, to which opinion you subscribe to. But as long as there's less than a kazayas of meat on the outside, it doesn't become tummy. And so therefore, that's the reason why. But it could be taka in achinami that if there was more than a kazayas of meat of the limb outside, then it would contaminate the meat that's on the same limb. Toshma. <clears throat> let's listen. Let's look at the next price. Hamotzi baser pesach me chabura le chabura. Now, uh, we know, as we're going to see in momentarily, that it is usher to take the carbon pesach out of its environs. Now, the word environs is vague. We know that you're not allowed to go outside of Yerushalayim, but there's a further restriction. You're not even allowed to take it outside of your chabura. What, what is what does the word chabura mean? Chabura means if, if you're in a middle, if you're in a collective of you, only the people that are supposed to eat it, you're not allowed to take it outside of your group to bring it somewhere else. So once you take it outside, we'll see. Once you take it even outside of the house, so you're you're outside of the environs and you're in violation. And so, alpha pishu who below sasa, even though you've if by taking it out of the house, you're in violation of the mitzvah slo sasa tohor. Still, the meat is tohor. So the Gemara wants to argue as follows: My love, tohor va'aser, diyotze mechabura lechabura, kayotze chutz lemechitzaso dami umifsol va'afilo hachi ketani tohor, amalo gazur rabbanan tuma. So the Gemara wants to argue as follows: The word tohor seems to imply that the meat does not transmit tuma, but it's still aser. In other words, since you violated a mitzvah slo sase, the meat is no longer edible because taking it outside of the house where your chabura is is tantamount to taking it outside of Yerushalayim. The meat therefore becomes aser, but it's still tahor. So you see that there's no gezeras tuma on meat that goes outside of its environs. So the Gemara says, lo. Tahor umutar, diyotze mechabur lechabur, lav kiyotze chutz lemechitza sodomi. Velo mifsel. The Gemara says, no. What really the Brisa means to tell me is that even though there's, it's, an, it's an iser to take the meat outside of the Chabura, but bidiyevit, if you do, the meat is still permissible. It's still permitted meat. It's not like taking it outside of Yerushalayim. So, uh, and therefore what? And therefore, that's the reason why it doesn't transmit tumma. But it could be altogether that if you take it outside of Yerushalayim, outside of its permitted environs, then taka not only is the meat aser, but the meat also transmits tuma. Frek the Gemara of Ahakatani Seifa, but wait a minute, look at the second part of that Brisa. Ha'ochlo hareza below sase. It says explicitly that if you eat the meat that left the chabura, you're in violation of the mitzvah's lo sase. So clearly the meat is aser. 
So how can you tell me that the meat is not usher? It says explicitly that the meat is usher. So again, we have a proof here that even though the meat has left its environs to the point where it's usher ba'achila, it does not transmit tuma. So the Gemara says, no. Bishlam alaman da'amar kebeitza di isbe kezayis velesbe kebeitza. If you hold that the amount that you need to transmit tuma for forbidden meat is a kebeitza, so then I could argue that what you did was you took only a kezayis, which is a half of a kebeitza. So you only took out a kezayis outside of the house where your, where your chabura is. And that's why it's asr ba'achila, but it doesn't transmit tuma because it's not the requisite size. But really, if it were the requisite size, it would transmit tuma. Elo laman da'amar kezayis ma'ikala meymar. But if you hold that the shear of transmission of tuma is a kezayis, then just like the Isser of Achila is a Shir Kezayis, so too the Shir of transmission of Tumas Kezayis. So if I'm in violation of the Mitzvah Slosase, then how can I not be transmitting Tumah? That's the question. So Ella biyotse bepesach lo mibailan de logazru rabbonan Tumah. So really, really the answer is, says the Gemara, if we're dealing with the Korban Pesach, taking it outside of the house where your Chabura is, there everyone agrees that you're not in violation, that there's no going to be, there's no possibility of that piece of meat transmitting Tumah. You know why? My taima, b'nei chapur is reason, hey no miser zihiri because you're in a public setting, you're with a group of guys, you're with a group of people that'll say, hey, where are you going with that piece of meat from the carbon Pesach? You're not allowed to take that out. So because it's such an uncommon occurrence that a person would carry it outside of its permitted environs, so that's the reason why Chachamim did not see fit to make a gezeira of Tumah as a disincentive, because you already have sufficiently disincentive in the fact that people are going to stop you before you're able to do it. But Our question is, what about other Kodshim? Other Kodshim, you could be eating privately. You could be eating in the privacy of your own home and you're at the edge of the city of Yerushalayim. You're eating your shlomim meat. And you decide, I'm going to go for a stroll, you go for a spazir outside Yerushalayim, and you forget that you've got a piece of meat in your pocket. Then the question is, did, were Chazal goes or Tuma on that meat or not? The Gemara says, take We don't have an answer for that. We're going to let that and sit. It's a historical fact. Either they did or they didn't. Well, so it could be that the discussion of the Amoraim was uh, that they didn't know because they were living uh, hundreds of years later. So now the Gemara says, Umotzi Basr Pesach Mechabura Lechabura Minayim. So Taka, let's ask the question, how do we Taka know that by taking the meat outside of the, the place where your Chabura is assembled is a mitzvah slosase? The Tanya lo sotzi min habayis min habasar chutzah, because the Torah says you may not take out of the house from the meat to the outside. So ainly elam ibayis labayis, chabur lechabur minayin. So the Brisa then continues and it says that that only teaches me that you can't take it outside of the house. But what if you have two chaburas in one house? You got one chabura upstairs and one chabura downstairs. It's a pretty active house, right? Let's say the shul makes a seder, right? And they make a, in the temple times, the, the synagogue in Yerushalayim has, the great synagogue makes a seder, and they let different chaburas, you know, for different classrooms with different chaburas. So, <laughs> or like on a hotel, like a Pesach resort in Yerushalayim at the time of the Beis Amikdash, right? So you're going to have different rooms, and everyone's got a different chabura. So how do you know that just taking it out from one hotel room to the other hotel room is also in violation, even though you're in the same structure? The extra word in the Pasuk Chutzah, which is totally extraneous, teaches me that even taking it outside within the same building, outside of your Chabura, is also a violation. Period. He says that the violation only sets in of taking the meat outside of your chabura is only when not only do you have to take it out, but you have to put it down in the new place, in the, in the, in where the other chabura is, uh, or, or outside and putting it down. But, but you're just holding on to it, and you haven't put it down yet, you're not in violation. And why is that? Because The answer is, is because the Torah uses the verb of taking it out. And it's the exact same verbiage that is used for the Isser of Hotza'a on Shabbos, of taking out on Shabbos. And just like we learned in the very first chapter of Masecha Shabbos, if you recall the very first Mishnah, that the definition of Hotza'a is doing an Akira, mm-hmm. lifting it up in one domain and putting it down in another domain, so too it's the same halacha. You have to lift it up out of your Chabura, mm-hmm. take it to another domain, and put it down. If you don't put it down, you're not in violation. So Masav Rabbi Abba Barmamul Hayusovlum Osan Bimotos 
הראשונים יצאו חוץ לחומס האזרה, ואחרונים לא יצאו, הראשונים מטעמים בגודם, ואחרונים אין מטעמים בגודם. So this is actually in Yana Diyama, it's a lot about Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, there were, there's a whole litany of sacrifices that you had to bring. The par and the so'ir of Yom Kippur, which are sacrificial <coughs> items, the carcass, after you did this, the sacrificial process, had to be burnt outside of the city of Yerushalayim. The, both the bull and the goat that were used sacrificially, you burned them outside of the city of Yerushalayim, outside of the Machane Yisrael. But we also learn, because, and the Torah says, the uh, hotzias hapor, El Michutz Lamachana, right? Is is Dixiv Yotzi El Michutz Lamachana that you shall take the the seir and the par and take them outside the camp using the same exact verb of Yotzi, and over there, it's interesting because it also says in the Torah Vasarefosa Yechabes Begadav that it says that the person who um, uh, uh, who is in charge of burning it, his clothes will become tame. So you see that Tuma sets in as soon as you take it out. And we learn that based on the, the drushes that the Gemara makes uh, in Yoma, that as soon as you take it out of the courtyard of the temple, out of the first camp, the halacha automatically is that your clothes become tame, the person who's carrying it out. So much so to the point where the Brisa says that if you're carrying out the carcass of the animal on a stretcher, so you got one guy in front, or a couple guys in the front, couple guys in the back carrying a stretcher. The guys who are carrying it out in the front, let's say at that, mo- at that juncture, where the guys in the front are outside the doorway of the, uh, of the courtyard, and the guys in the back are still in the, uh, the doorway, uh, still within the, the courtyard, at that moment, the guys in the front, their clothing becomes tame, and the guys in the back, their clothing is still tar. Well, the animal's in the middle. The animal's in between. The animal's on the stretcher. So the guys in the back, you know, you, you freeze the frame. At that specific moment, the guys in the front are tummy. The guys in the back are not yet tummy. So the Gemara's question is, if you're telling me that the definition of hotza'a is picking it up and putting it down, then how can you tell me that the guys who haven't yet even put down the animal yet they are metame their begadim, are making their clothing tummy? Doesn't make sense. So the Gemara says, "Who mosiv la, who mefarik la benigra?" Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. The the hollow nach it was it was it was never put down. So who mosiv la, who mefarik la benigrarin? He asks the question and he resolves it by saying that the case over there is in the Brisa is talking about where you're dragging the animal outside on the stretcher. So therefore, the whole time it's an akira and a hanach. In other words, there's no. You're, it's not you're, you're carrying it in the normal fashion, but by dragging it out immediately upon leaving the threshold of the uh, of the doorway of the azara, you've already done a hanach. Even That's if it the answer. Stop, even if it keeps <clears throat> Presumably so, because each moment is considered to be another hanach. Take that approach, and the hanach <clears throat> dragging it. The front guys are dragging, then the part that's still in the hanacha is still inside the azara at that freeze frame moment. No, the 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 the, the hanacha is as soon as the, the a portion of the animal is is put down, a portion of the animal is still is still is still outside. They've taken a portion of the animal outside, so that's called a hotza. It's called a hotza with a hanacha. Okay, let's go weiter. Mishnah. So this mishnah we've seen already. So we just will fly through it. Aver shiatsa mitzasa chose chad shemagila etzem v'kolif chad shemagila perik v'chotze. The chosech, that if the limb is partially in and partially out, you can't just hack at the bone because you're not allowed to break any bones. So rather, what you have to do is you have to incise carefully down to the bone, peel back the meat, so, and then at, all, all the way to the joint, and then sever at the joint. And now you have this uh, this boneless uh, filleted meat of carbon pesach from that poor portion of the of the limb. But with other sacrificial animals in the same scenario, since there's no prohibition of breaking bones, just take a sharp cleaver and go whack, right? And then you cut it, you incise it exactly at the point of where, uh, of where, the, of where it, it's protruding outwards because there's no prohibition of breaking bones. Rabbi, I'm sorry, this question might be redundant, but why for the Pesach offering... Uh, is the breaking of the bone so crucial as opposed to another uh, hormone? That's, that's a very good question. That's never right. been discussed in the Mishnah why the mitzvah is such. There are a number of answers that are provided for this. 
One answer is, is because you want the carcass to be visible that this was the god of the Egyptians and we've defeated them. So in order to make it clearly visible, you have to leave the carcass intact. Another reason that's suggested by the Rishonim is because it's supposed to be the Achila of a ben Chorin who's like a melech, a free man who's like a king. And just like a king will not doesn't need to uh, lower himself to break the bones to get every piece of meat because if he's still hungry, he'll just fetch another animal. So too, we don't allow you to break bones so that you can demonstrate that you're, uh, you're royalty and that you don't, you're rich and royalty and you don't need to worry about breaking the bones to get the meat. Okay, so the Gemara now says, now uh, the Mishnah concludes by saying, min ha'agaf ilifnim kilifnim, min ha'agaf ilachutz kilachutz. The, the, the Mishnah says, now what about the doorway itself? The doorway itself, is it inside or is it outside, as far as Kodshim are concerned? So it says it depends. The, the word agaf is the door jam, which means the part of the doorway in the center, which is narrower than the rest of the doorway so that the door can jam against it, okay? So that part of the doorway, from the doorway going, from the door jam inwards is inside, and from the door jam going outwards, it's outside. What about the width of the door jam itself? That's left ambiguous by the Mishnah, so we'll analyze that momentarily. So, hachalonos ve'ove hachoma kilifnim. And finally, the windows and the wall widths, if you were to take it outside of the wall, not through a doorway, but through some other way, let's say the windows, or some other pro, uh, hole in the wall, so then that would be like it's on the inside. Okay, it's still considered to be on the inside. So let's analyze this. Amar of Yehuda, Amar Rav, v'chein la tefila. The same halacha applies to davening. Now, what does it mean the same halacha applies to davening? I'm going to hold that for just a second. Let's see the, opi- the, the opposing opinion. Utliga de Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. The Amar of Yeshua ben Levi, afilu mechitza shel barzal ena mafsekes ben Yisrael la'avim shabash shamayim. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, no, that even an iron curtain cannot divide between Israel and their father in heaven, which was a great slogan during the years of Soviet Jewry, if you remember. So, right. And, and in any event, so what, what, is, what is the machlokas? There's a big machlokas here between Rashi and Tosfus as far as what this halach of tefillah. Rashi says that we're talking about if you, if you have nine guys inside a room and the tenth guy is on the other side of a doorway, the halacha will apply that if, even if you're in the door frame of the doorway, but if you're beyond the door jam, it's like you're outside, mm-hmm. and therefore you're not mitzaref to a minion, you don't have a minion, you can't say kedusha, you can't say chazor, it's nothing, you can't say any dover shebikdusha. However, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi disagrees, and he says, no, even if there's mamish an iron curtain, an iron door, that's dividing between the nine guys and the one guy, as long as they can hear each other, they're mitzaref to a minion. Now, Tosfa says, I have a very serious problem with this interpretation of Rashi. Why? Because we say in another, in another Maseches, in, in, in Sota and in Brachos, I think, we say that we paskin like Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. And if we paskin like Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, but we don't paskin like that. In other words, we paskin that in order to have a minion to be mitzvah, if you all have to be in the same room. And you can't have a guy on the other side of the door jam. So how can we paskin like Rabbi Shua ben Levi according to the way, the way Rashi's learning this whole sugya? So Tosfa says it's, this is not, the discussion over here is not whether, to, whether you have a duly constituted minion. The question over here is when you have 10 guys inside a room and you have an 11th guy who's on the other side of the door, other side of the door jam, can he answer to Kaddish and Kaddush and Baruch That's the issue over here. And that's where you have a machlokis between Rav Yehudah Marav and Rav Yeshua ben Levi. Mm. Rav says that if you're on the other side of the door jam, then you can't even answer Kaddish and Kedusha to where the minion is saying. But Rav Yeshua ben Levi disagrees. He says, no, even if there's a mamish, a solid do- door or a wall dividing between them, as long as you can hear them, you can answer Kaddish and Baruch and, and, and Kedusha. <laughs> and that taka we do, Paskin, like Rav Yeshua ben Levi, mm-hmm. that you don't have to be in the room as long as you hear them saying, Yehei Shmei Rabbah, you should say Yehei Shmei Rabbah with them. Okay? <laughs> but they can't be part of the Some, but Same thing by chauffeur, exactly. Okay. <laughs> What's that? They can't be counted as a minion. But you can't be counted as part of the minion. That's precisely the point. I've mentioned this halacha to a lot of people. People don't realize 
that uh, it, it, a lot of times this is relevant in a shiva house. In a shiva house, you sometimes have, even in the middle of a living room, sometimes you have what's called a tzura sapesa. You have a doorway, but let's say half the minion is in the dining room and the other half the minion is in the living room. They clearly see each other, but you got five guys in the dining room, five guys in the living room. You're not mitzari for a minion because you've got a doorway dividing between the two. Even of if you. it's open? Even if it's open. Yeah. Here we're talking about open doors. <laughs> it's just a question of, you know, it, even the guy who's in the doorway, but if he's behind the door jam, it's not okay. So surely, if you're on two sides of a tzura sapesach, you're not going to be mitzari for a minion. Huh. So you have to be careful in certain, in certain uh, uh, home situations. <laughs> there would be a mezuzah on that, so that's a doorway. As long as there's no lentil on the top. That's right. So whatever whatever constitutes a doorway for mezuzah purposes would be the same thing as dividing up a, a, a group of guys for a minion. You have to be careful about that. Okay, Viter. So um, so the Gemara now says, Hagu Fakasha. There's an inherent contradiction in the mission itself. Amart min ha'agaf alifnim kilifnim. Ha'agaf atzmo kilachutz. So he says, the first thing you said was that if you're from the door jam inwards, then that's the inside. The impl- implication being that the door jam width itself is outside. <coughs> Aim is safe, but then look at the next line. Mina agaf ilachutz kilachutz, agaf u'atzmo kilifnim. Then you said, but if from the door jam going outwards is outside. So it's mashma that the width of the door jam itself is inside. So how do you reconcile it? Lokasha, kan b'sharei azara, kan b'sharei Yerushalayim. The answer is as follows. It depends what doorway you're talking about. The doorway to the gates of Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem doorway, that's considered to be still on the outside. The, the, the width of the door jam. And we'll see why in just a second. When it comes to the gates of the courtyard, the gates of the courtyard are considered to be still on the inside, the, um, the, the door jam width. As, as Rabbi, Shmuel, Rabbi Shmuel had said, why were the gates of Jerusalem, the width of the gates themselves, where the door jam is, why were they not sanctified? Why are they considered to be still outside of Yerushalayim? The answer is, is because we need to protect people from the elements. A mitzora has to be sent all the way out of Yerushalayim, out of the Machane Israel. But this, he's going to be, he's going to feel like a leper. He is a leper. He's going to, but he's going to feel, <laughs> he's going to feel like he's uh, totally uh, ostracized. What about when it's very cold or when it's very hot? He needs to be, have some protection from the elements. He wants to be close to the city. So we, therefore, we said we're not going to sanctify the width of the doorway so that he can at least stand underneath the doorway to get some protection from the elements, from the sun or from the rain. And all, whereas all the gates of the, or the doorways of the Azara were sanctified to be considered to be on the inside, the one exception is a gate called Sha'ar Nikanor. Sha'ar Nikanor is the gate that divides between, between the Ezra's Nashim and the Ezra's Yisrael. It's the, it's the gate that divides between the outer courtyard and the inner courtyard. And there's a halacha that a mitzora, once his seven days of sanctification are over, he is allowed now to come all the way up through to the Ezra's Nashim. But he can't come up to the Ezra's Yisrael, but he needs to get sanctified. And part of his sanctification process is that we place blood on his, on his fingers and on his toes. So how do we do that if he's not allowed to come up to and into the Machna Yisrael where the sacrifice is being offered? The answer is is that the gate that is divided, dividing between the Ezra Yisrael and the Ezra Nashim is called the Shar Nikanor, it's called the Nikanor Gate. And there, that gate was not sanctified to be part of as the, uh, the, inner, the inner courtyard. This enables the Mitzorah to stick his hands and his toes into the width of the gateway, and the coin will just pl- do the placement of blood at that point. And that's why they didn't sanctify the gate <laughs> over there. But all the other gates of the, of the temple... Uh, all the other courtyards, the outer gates and so forth, those, the width of the doorways, including the door jams, were sanctified to be considered part of the inside. We'll hold it here for today. A Gamar Chasim